and a I, scholar. I got a chocolate chip cookie on the way. <laughs> awesome, dude. Are you? Uh, Did oh, I just? What the yeah, hell? you just you just blanked out, son. Oh, oh crap! Justin, All right, hold on. I hope this isn't some sort of joke. So I finished uh, Contagious. Oh, what'd you think? I uh, liked it a lot, and it, and uh, uh, and they mentioned Made to Stick in Contagious, which mm-hmm. I had started but put down to read Contagious. So now I'm now stick. I'm going back to Made to Stick, and it's awesome because you could hear in Made to Stick they're talking about like, yeah, we started doing all this once we read Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point, and then you yeah. go back to that. It's ama- it, it's amazing to read so much nonfiction that you start to see the the thread of ideas between all well, these books. And remember, Contagious the his uh, graduate thesis like advisor or whatever was one of the authors of made to stick oh that's right you did uh, you did mention that i, I mean, forgot yeah, that and the, the, he talks about that in there so it is a it is interesting it's like you know how like <clears throat> once you get looped into sort of some of these circles and stuff it's very interesting because then you're like oh you meet so-and-so at a conference who knows so-and-so and then you know this little group of people and you start to think oh everybody knows these things you know, and, and that's like a lot of economic theory, a lot of evolutionary psychology and things like that. You're like, oh, yeah, everybody I know knows that. Like, yeah, everybody I know who in this circle, in this conference, who knows these people know this stuff. But outside of there. Right. Right. They're all know, brand new ideas. Like a lot of the, you know, the Stephen Pinker, like the decline of violence and that sort of stuff. To us, it's just been like, well, yeah, duh. But I mean, you go around outside of kind of that particular. Now, I read I read this this alleged refutation of uh, Pinker's book. And it's uh, like his only point he had was like. No, it's not getting better. It's like there's still a lot of bad stuff. He just yeah. listed all the stuff that was bad as if like that in any way invalidated Pinker's claims in the book. Yeah, oh. you know, my mom was kind of a jerk to me yesterday. <laughs> no, she wasn't. She's a sweetheart. But no, but yeah, it's, it's that it's that it's that type one and type two error. It's the, the inability to understand, you know, it, that's, you know, my question often to these people is like, you know, oh, things are the better or worse. Like, how do you measure this? How do you measure this other than your personal feelings? What metric do you use to measure this? And then we can start to have a discussion about this beyond just our feelings and our intuition. Yeah. Um, well, and especially like, uh, you know, and if, if you want to, you know, make make his thesis a little more laborious, you can say, you know, by these metrics, this trend is blurred, blurred, blurred. And then it's like, I don't know. Um, here, let me hear Justin talk and then we're ready to go. Uh, again. Check, check, check. One, two, three. One, two, three. Great. Yes. He can talk, Brian. <laughs> EFG. <laughs> all right. All the time. Deleting. All right. Ready to go in five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to Weird Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Oh, yeah. Justin Robert Young. Hey, friends. Yeah, we're all friends here, right, guys? We're friends. <laughs> we're friendly. I mean, you wouldn't know it from the way we uh, sometimes uh, behave in our Wait, fantasy I, scenarios. I, like, I totally berate Justin, the the one person who's been there for every important endeavor <laughs> I've ever done, and without which I would probably be living out of my car in Fort Lauderdale. Well, and the and the funny part, relax. the the funny part is how uniform you are about it. It's like there's no other move than behind, besides calling him a shaved ape or uh, or like yeah, a unshaved, Sasquatch. Yeah. Well, when you're that indebted to somebody, <laughs> Listen, you got you to create enough. leverage, you know, yeah. you, you got to just make it anywhere you can. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, if I'm start being nice to him, you're going to think one of us has cancer. So. Oh, dude. Exactly. No, I mean, we can't worry the kids. Yeah. So, uh, guys, I am excited. I am I'm not just excited because I saw the Spectre trailer, mind you. No, I am. Um, do you see the trailer, Brian? No, I haven't. I haven't. Oh, well, I pity you. Um, but but but, you, but you're deeper into Bond than I am. You went back and oh, rewatched all Bond. the Bonds. Deep, deep into Bond, yeah. yeah. No, no, I mean, it's been uniformly um, excited people. I mean, so. good. But no, that's it's not great. What to- it, it's, it's uh, I mean, as, as for whatever you thought about Skyfall, you know, I, I think it was a, it was a very well-made movie it looked really really cool and you know it, it's kind of brought a different sort of aesthetic i think to the bond franchise uh and i mean i, I think casino royale did did a good uh, job in that as well but uh this is awesome it just it feels like its own entity like it feels yeah. like it, it is a sequel to skyfall in what its look and everything and like, like christoph waltz i was kind of 
worried would kind of be a little bit too on the nose as a Bond villain. But the way that they have chosen to introduce him in that trailer, I think, was note perfect. It was great. You know, there, there are things you want things to be when they appreciate what makes them great. And that's what's cool. But I'm not here to talk about that. Guys. No, 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 hell no. I'll talk about something else that has me tingly excited. What's that? Uh, well, uh, you know, I like caves. Right? Oh, yeah. Well, you're the brave explorer. You brave uh, young rough and tumble ne'er do well adolescents in order to go to to uh, was it Bigfoot Caves? Is that what it was? Uh, it was Ape Cave. Man. Ape Cave. Ape, yeah. Ape, yeah, yeah. Ape yeah. Cave. Which uh, um, reminded me of a Bionic Man episode, but I'll forget about that. <laughs> Gentlemen, um, and I like lava tubes. I love lava tubes. That's actually what I was in as a lava tube. Why do I like lava tubes? Oh, because that's, that's where we're going to live in the future, on Mars. That's, that'll be the first place we go. We could also live in other places in lava tubes, too, Bri. Wait, Justin. Here on Earth? Well, well we, yeah, but I mean other places, not this place. Gentlemen. There are some other people who understand this, have seen this. Well, I mean, people thought about this for like, you know, I think original Buck Rogers was the guy who went to sleep in a cave on the moon. Um, maybe not the original. Anyhow, I digress. Point is, <laughs> David Blair and colleagues from Purdue University in West Lafayette, uh, depends on what part of the, the, where you are in the south or not the south, if it's Lafayette or Lafayette, Used computer modeling to determine the stability of lunar lava tubes with different ri- lo- widths, roof shapes. Oh, and- man, I didn't even think of that. Of course. It's been the first it's the first modern reassessment of how stable these can be, he told BBC News. So what they did is they used these things called computers <laughs> to model, to look at this, to look at the uh, – the different type of material to look at like the gravity to look at the structure to figure out how stable would it be if you go to another planet or another moon you know and you want to live somewhere you know what you want to live probably the lava tubes are great the reason lava tubes are great or caves are great on other planets is because of radiation when you have tiny thin or non-existent atmospheres you're getting pulverized by space rays every single second that will fry you on the inside that'll cook your gonads or whatever parts you have down there and Ruin your day. So you need another way to survive. So don't, 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 wait, don't, don't, uh, don't, I'm not, don't I'm not looking, don't I'm not looking, wait, 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 I'm not wait. looking. Brian, because there's, it gets better. Okay, gets all right. Better. Okay. All right. The winner of the most awesome, because you think, all right, lava tubes, okay, how cool, I mean, lava tubes, all right, I've been in like a garage or I've been in there, like how cool, I don't want to live in a cave like some sort of dirty mole person, no offensive to mole people, by the way, okay, I'm just... No. It's just a perception, okay? That's I don't terrible. want to live like that. Who could live like that? But then we get to probably the most awesomest infographic I've ever seen <laughs> relating to living inside of lava tubes or caves on a lunar surface, Brian. This one I love will that that's the- a list, by the way, <laughs> that, that he is keeping tally on. is just infographics related to lava tubes for human use. Justin, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna eat those words. I uh, know. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I, I celebrate. I celebrate this. I want you to, you may now scroll down and look at this infographic. All I right, want here you we to go. Describe, you have to describe everything you see in your reaction. All right. First of all, uh, this is the BBC News. Lava tube safe enough for moon base. You scroll down, you got a photo ooh, of a nice ooh. lava tube. Lava tube. Uh, I mean, that looks cozy. I don't mind being in there. This is up from Hawaii. Safe little thing, like just burrow in there for, for you know, hibernating. Oh, here we go. For example, moon surface temperature can vary by several hundred degrees uh, Celsius during the course of a lunar uh, lunar okay. day. And they show you a cave entrance from uh, Mare Tranquilitas, the Sea of Tranquility, I assume. And uh, and then, holy cow! So uh, we've we've got uh, wait, whoa, just emotions alone, Justin. All right. So what we see is a just big... emotions, not facts, just feelings. Oh, well, all right. So, number one, if it this is, because I can't really read what it says, but it just, by the infographic alone, oh, my God, I thought it was a battleship. <laughs> it's instead, <laughs> Philadelphia approximated compared to, I guess, the area of these lunar tubes, and Philadelphia is like a, a, a little speck, a little like a marker drawing in the far right-hand corner. That's insane. 
I mean, this is this is extraordinary, right? So it's like uh, you, you see a bubble. It's like a side cutaway view of this thing. And it looks like you could fit like five Philadelphias across it. Um, and uh, which I, I, I can't wrap my mind around this, even as as we're saying this. This is like enough room that you could you you, you have acreage to farm. You could throw a bunch of. Uh, of 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 sports complexes in there. I mean, it's gigantic, and it you could totally picture. You know, let's say let's say in the next you know thirty fifty years we get some kind of uh, effective sustainable fusion reactor. You could just have a sun, just throw a sun up on top. It's amazing, That's insane. So what we're looking at is the caption below says lunar lava tube should be stable up to five kilometers wide. In uh, in American, you know, that's like, uh, you know, at least, you know, like two and mile. two miles. No, two, two, it's, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's it is quite a distance across. So it's about three miles across, and then they show you see, and we're looking at it in two dimensions. So you're just seeing Philadelphia as one part of it, but we're not looking at it from the top to see what the amount of area underneath there is incredible. I mean, and so what they're saying is that not only could a, a lava tube of that structure, that size, be stable, they also say that a lava tube of that size is possible. Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I've never seen, I loved seeing this uh, this cave entrance photo. That, to me, is is the more visceral of the images because it, it, it I, I don't think of... Things like there being, I, I don't think of the moon, of course, as, as volcanically active because it's not anymore, but certainly it was. I mean, y you're right, man. This is gold mine. This is, this is the primo, most valuable real estate on the moon are these, uh, or, or on Mars, are these lava tubes. Dude, and now that we know, we have, well, we don't know, but we have evidence that says these things are huge, could be, could be very, very huge and stable, it's exciting. It's because you think about like how do you build a lunar city? Well, you got to build a lunar city, but if you get this thing and you seal off the top and you seal the entire, you seal the insides. First, you have a thing to par to park your paper thin RVs inside of there, not worry about radiation, and just pressurize the inside of them like tin cans. And then when you find enough source of oxygen, which the moon apparently has a lot of, you can start pumping that thing full of air, reach pressure, and then boom, build Philadelphia inside of there. This uh, so here's the thing is is we're, we all have Mars fever and I think we, we could say like as a society those are the stories that really inspire us and get us excited. Um, and part of it is because we've been to the moon and Mars is the next challenge, but I think also we're we're just acutely aware that the moon uh, is never going to be Earth, right? Whereas Mars, oh. you know, we talk about terraforming and and eventually making it kind of another uh, another Earth, but logistically. Like the moon is such an important proving ground to uh, for the technology. And, and like if we can make a colony in a lava tube on the moon, th the day to day life would be almost identical to the day to day life on Mars, uh, um, except for when you go outside and the gravity is different. Yeah, I think that. I, I, yes, it would be. I would say it would be compared to day to day life on Earth. Absolutely true. But each one is going to have its own challenges. You know, when you're when you're on when you're living in the moon, in the moon, you know, like you said, gravity, you're going to have much, much reduced gravity. And that might be problematic for living for longer periods of time. You know, when you're 10th of Earth gravity there, that's that's one thing. And you're going to think about things. Differently. I think it's, it's one sixth. I think it's one sixth on the moon and yeah. uh, and for, uh, 40 percent on Mars. So if you look at like your your gravity is going to be, you know, to the point that you're probably going to suffer some sort of material loss. And also you're so much lighter i mean you're so much closer to earth though too is that like you're you know we were we were sending probes and stuff like that to the moon in the 60s and so the idea that you're not as remote like ah i broke the microwave guys ah geez you know it's oh, not yeah. going on for three days yeah. you break the microwave on the mars and then 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 it's back to the yeah, stove yeah. and, top and, and you're screwed for what like five years until somebody can bring another microwave out well, the the supply chain is much much shorter, and and plus also, I mean, if we if we envision, it's what like a three day trip to the moon? Is that what it is, or is it three days round trip? Um, no, it was like three days too there. Yeah. Okay. So you're three days away. I mean, you're that makes so much more sense because it's like you're coming, you're going, you're you're uh, uh, 
you're taking vacations <laughs> to, yeah. to, to the moon. I mean, I don't know. It's incredible. The moon well, will be like our Canada, you know? <laughs> I mean, all right. So this is awesome to think about, but isn't the real question whether or not we can get the technology uh, up to snuff to be able to live in these uh, situations? Like, I mean, like, it's awesome that we would be able to live somewhere else, but it's all about that whole pressurization and living life in the most most Earth-like way possible. Like, I guess, like, that's, I mean, like, yeah. now, now as these dreams stop becoming kind of fantasy and start becoming real, I feel like that's where, like, like now we have to, like, start solving real-world problems. Like, you know, who's going to bring the couch? You know, it's it just, like, it, it's really, really cool to think about. To be sure. And I don't, I think that, I, I like the idea of doing both and, and the idea of doing both, of solving the problems of the challenges of Mars and solving the challenge of the moon. Because also, like, you're, you're going to have, there is certain things like how do you seal this cave? How do you do this sort of thing? And we've been doing things with underwater mining, channel building, and other kinds of stuff where we have we have tools to solve these problems with. But at the end of the day, survival, you know, how to survive on the moon is going to be very different than how do you survive on Mars given the different materials that are available. You so, know, yeah, and, you're talking about in terms of, you know, in both cases, in as much as possible, you want to live off the land. Um, and obviously, Mars, it's very important to do so. Uh, if you can envision a vastly reduced expense to get to the moon, thanks to, you mm. know, like the three stage reusable rockets from SpaceX or whatever, it, you can maybe bring a lot more equipment that way. But I mean, yeah, they, they will be different. But as far as the. You know, from from Earth, the if we were to see a person living on Mars, a person living on the moon, I'd say like 90, 95 oh, percent of their day is going to look identical to to be sure. But I think from like a materials point of view, if you're like, well, we can use lunar soil to do this. We can't find these things on Mars. Like if you're if like Mars just didn't have metallic materials or things like that, you'd be like, oh, man, you know, we're 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 going to be screwed because we can't do certain things there versus I think that like the material difference could make a big, huge have a big, huge effect about that, like the availability of water and all in your, uh, yes, up to the earth per point of view, absolutely. But when it comes to figuring out how you're actually, you know, what are your economies going to be based on, what your survival is going to be based on, it might be very different, but there are going to be a lot of the same questions we're asking. And yeah. I think that like, and you mentioned like, you know, making Mars earth-like, I mean, yes, but then it's, it's going to be, it's, it's own thing, you know? So who builds the first lunar tube colony? Like, like, how does this happen? Yeah, I would imagine a government, right? Unless it's like a planetary, is it Planetary Ventures, the, the space mining conglomerate? Yeah, but they're yeah. all just mining asteroids. Yeah, but cer certainly like something like that could be put together. Because again, like once the price to get to orbit plummets, so all of a sudden the, you get oh, all oh, kinds like of the idea that it's a, it's a factory town on the moon. Yeah. Because we're doing some stuff on the moon. That's what I would yeah. imagine. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I think that you're going to, you know, you're going to get, you know, Google has their own lunar project where they're like, you know, willing, hey, you know, we'll, we'll give you a prize if you, you know, put it something on the, on the moon and you can explore it, whatever. And the, you know, you get into, I, I'm not a believer in trying to build a business model on tourism. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm all for tourism or space tourism, but you don't want to build, you know, the, the future of humanity is exploration of the universe on tourism because that is an extremely fickle beast and, and can come to a crashing end. You want things that are sustainable. And, you know, Mars is not going to be sustainable for a hell of a long time because, you know, you think about, I'll give you an example. People say, oh, why don't we make iPhones in the United States? Why don't we make iPhones in the United States? Hey, why don't we make iPhones in the United States? Glad you asked that, Justin. <laughs> Technically speaking, you know, we, we can make an iPhone in the United States in, in theory. But when you build an iPhone in China, in a, in a Taiwanese-owned factory, and you hire Chinese people to make them and Chinese robots to make them, part of the advantage there isn't just that there's a skill set or they know how to do it. Actually, the skill set belongs mainly to the Taiwanese and the Apple engineers that know how to do this, but because they have a supply chain there. The place that makes your LCD screens or your, you know, your, your screens is a mile down the road. The people that make the microchips are 10 miles over, over this way. The people that make the motherboards are over there. There's an entire supply chain there, batteries, everything. That's all there. Now, you could yeah. ship all those parts to here and put it together and say assembled here, but it would take you much, much longer and all those things there. When you talk about doing things on Mars, you know, 
where do you get capacitors? You know, where do you get copper wire? You know, where do you get some of these basic sort of things? And you think about, you know, what we do when something breaks or whatever, it's, oh, well, I just go order a new one from Amazon. But when you're on another planet and, you know, we can say, well, 3D print it. Well, fan of 3D printing. I don't know if you got that memo. Um, <laughs> There are there are there are many many you you know you, you can't make most things with 3D printing, you know you can't make paper with a 3D printer, right? Well yet, uh, well so let's get back to like if not space tourism then then what is the draw that makes it sustainable on its own and and I guess one of the nice things about the moon is that we 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 know some of the materials that are valuable there like uh, is it helium three that they have that uh, that that would make it profitable to to set up a, a thing, hold on, I'm looking at an old, um, uh, an old Popular Mechanics article here. It says, Mining the Moon, um, the price, I think it was like $40,000 an ounce, I want to say. 40, uh, there you go, yeah. Uh, projected value of $40,000 per ounce, 220 pounds of helium-3 would be worth about $141 million, okay? So, but, but understand, too, that that is... It, that's also based upon like present production levels and our ability to to find it or you know refine you know, get it heat right now like and so I mean, I mean that that's it's like it's like antimatter you know what's what, the price of you know a couple of molecules of antimatter it's hundreds of millions of dollars right well and, to, well, and, 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 and here on earth we saw uh, it used to be that aluminum was one of the that was way more valuable than silver uh, Napoleon as a matter of fact uh, impressed everyone by having uh, aluminum uh, forks and utensils for everyone to use until somebody figured out a way to uh, uh, vast reduce the because naturally occurring aluminum is very very uh hard to find whereas if you have tons of i think it's clay and you use some kind of like bo borax or bauxite i forgot what it was but there's something that you can extract all the aluminum out very cheaply and all of a sudden the value of aluminum plummet plummeted so you're right in that right now helium 3 is an extremely valuable commodity because it's hard for us to get our hands on and that wouldn't always be the case but i don't know that that's a reason to not project that mining will be the first most valuable self-sustaining I, I don't i don't know i'm reading the wikipedia where it says current u.s industrial consumption of helium-3 is approximately sixty thousand liters which you go okay how much is that well that's eight kilograms um right and the cost at auction has typically been around a hundred dollars a liter so you know we start working on that like yeah it comes out to like yeah I don't, i'm not saying it's not i'm not saying it's not i'm just saying that it, it, it's a we're basing trying to base an economic model on something that's several steps beyond and well, so and so what what uh, so so it sounds like uh, so you you don't agree that that it'll be a mining town first what what do you think will be first i don't know i i would say that i don't know first i would say that i i, I don't know and i'm well that's not the game the game is we're we're placing uh, well, bets i'm going to get to what i know <laughs> i'm going to get, get to what, what i do know what i do know brian all right brushwood <laughs> that is your name what I do know, as we've talked about before, is that there are many, many materials that are produced in low or zero G environments that are very interesting in certain kinds of manufacturing that become fascinating. And so, you know, I work with, I have my little 3D printers, which I love to play with and, and use. And as we saw looking at those lava tubes, when you have that reduced gravity, what you can do that's really cool, when you start thinking about what happens when you start putting 3D printing machines and things like that, on the moon, we have reduced gravity, so you can make things taller, steeper, whatever. And I'm talking about microchips, bubble memory, all sorts of things like that. When you start bringing, putting little bacteriums inside of there, I think, I think there's going to be a ton of industrial research potentials and a ton of industrial materials that'll be shorter term. You want to talk about making carbon fiber nanotubes and other kinds of oh, stuff. Oh wow! That's where, I get, that's where I'm saying, okay, I can I can wrap my head around that a little bit easier than. Well, and, and I can even see, like, let's say, let's say theoretically, these are the same kind of materials that you could do on a space station, but it's fairly inconvenient to live at zero G because you can only do it for so long or whatever. But if you figured out a way to do it on lunar gravity, you know, kind of as a middle road before you try to figure out how to manufacture it on Earth, that could be you huge. And you look at like imaging ships like CCD and all that kind of stuff. And, and one of the biggest revolutions was figuring out how to take one that was on, you know, theoretically not as precise and efficient as other kinds of imaging tips, but having it be good enough and dirty enough and enough pixels enough to make it work fine. 
you know, where you're like, oh, this can be, we can make this cheaper. And that might be a case like, yeah, perfect environment. You know, we make it in zero G. But you know what? If we make it on the moon in one six gravity, you know, it'll be, it's still going to be three orders of magnitude better than what's on Earth or whatever. Yeah. Uh, no, I see that. What's your, what's your gamble, Justin? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would think if it, if it is private industry, then... Boo! Downer! Downer! Get him off the show! <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, my, my thought is that it would probably be some like the first thing to do it would be some kind of like government cooperative. Let's like put a thing there that's like a research station or something like that. And then, you know, the idea of it being a private industry uh, thing will, will happen to me. I guess it, we are rapidly coming to a point in which I feel like people who make rules here on earth are going to start staking out the claim on who makes rules not on earth and i'm i'm i think that that if if the more this becomes a reality the more i think it could become i think it would be a rad nasa thing to be like hey look we're going to do this this is like nasa's about making stuff on different planets now get some you know, you know and a way to think about it too is is thinking along those lines is that you know Oceans are fascinating. We love the idea of exploring our oceans and doing stuff like that. And you know who's done an amazing job of exploring our oceans and built some incredible technologies for surviving at all sorts of different depths? James in, Cameron. Yeah, him too. The oil companies. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Because once you'll have like – as we pointed, we'll have these sort of, oh, this will be an interesting sort of thing. Once we figure out like, no, no, there really is a margin. We can make 8% on our dollar or whatever doing X, Y, or Z. Then all of a sudden, you know, you put a ton of resources into it, and which I don't think is a bad thing. I think that it's a, you know, done right. You know, it's a very, very helpful thing. It helps me out. I think that, you know, if, if you know, the, the hydrogen, the, the helium-3 production rather is, is, you know, and I think I looked up hydrogen-3, not helium-3, and so we're going to get letters. We're going to get angry. No, I looked up helium-3. Um, I think that we're going to get ang angry letters about that. No, I think that you're going to see where there's money to be made and demonstrably money to be made. You'll get a tremendous amount of resources coinciding with whatever sort of genuine research we're doing. But it might be like, you know, how we o ocean exploration or exploitation today. Right on. Gentlemen, speaking of exploitation, I mean exploration. <laughs> Waka waka. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I smell where this is headed. Hang on. Let me type P A T R E O N dot com slash weird things. Wrong, Brian. I was totally not going to go there. Oh, sorry. Well, uh, I'm just going to leave this here where everyone can see it. All right. I was actually going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> we have a Weird Things Patreon. If you want to support the Weird Things podcast, you can go there. Weirdthings.com slash, excuse me, patreon.com slash Patreon. Somebody else take over. Uh, Patreon.com uh, slash weird things. <laughs> that's it. 440 patrons. Uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, your support has made possible not only us doing this on a regular basis, but also bringing on the amazing uh, Neshcom as our producer. So uh, thanks for being a friend. Right. Now, speaking of Neshcom, the producer, um, he took over a little project for us, a much neglected thing which was the Facebook Weird Things Com. Facebook.com slash Weird Things Com is where mm -hmm. I'm headed. Hey, look at this. We got, we're all legit now. You look at there, Neshcom has been, that's Bryce, by the way, has been posting some interesting stuff. He has, the latest one is a dead girl solves her own murder. What? Um, which sounds totally legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> Totally real. Um, he's got an article about the, the current ma mission to put astronaut Scott Kelly into space while we monitor his brother on Earth to see uh, how different it is. And some other interesting articles. So he's just started doing that. So if you want to go like the page and follow it, go to Weird Things Science. Uh, it's a science website, apparently. Um, go there, and we'll also be posting the podcast there, too. Now, there's weirdthings.com, of course, but we also have a Facebook. We have a Facebook, guys. Dude, if you're just a fan of the podcast... Why don't, you, why, don't you, why don't you throw us a like? Yeah, come on over. That it's Facebook.com slash WeirdThingsCom. Nice. Gentlemen. So, so we have agreed it's our mission to live in space, right? We're all going to live in space, right? Sure. Yeah, man. Hell, I'm ready to go right now. 
Yeah. Brian, you're going to go live in space? Well, I mean, I'm going to live in space, you know, to get to Mars, but then I'll live on Mars. All right, cool. I don't cool. think if Mars is in Earth space. Earth is mine! Um, <laughs> it's all a trick. All a oh, lot. man, what an elaborate ruse to get everybody to leave so you can crown yourself emperor. Bye, everybody! <laughs> oh, I'll catch up. I'll meet you yeah. there. Bye. Oh, sits in the garage. It's good. It's good. I'll be there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clean up, guys. Take care of some things. Like, oh, they're gone. Oh, they're gone. I was like so stoked about the whole premise of the show, Last Man on Earth, because I'm like, man, if they can really do a show just about one guy left on Earth, that'll be awesome. If it breaks down into some sort of like there are other people and all that, I'll be disappointed. So guess what show I don't watch? Oh, <laughs> uh, man, that's uh, I actually don't know anything about The Last Man on Earth. I, I, I'm i sad to have even heard that much because I wanted to give it a try. But that's my fault for not. I'm sure it's a great it. show. I'm sure it's a great show. But like, guess what? There are other people. I'm like, man, like if they were brave enough to figure out how to make that premise work, that would be awesome. You know, but, you know, Night of the Comet did it perfectly. So why touch it? Uh, the other people won. So, um, guys, I don't want to scare you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, seriously. Um, you know, we, we keep asking, like, where are the aliens at? You know, yo, where are my aliens at? And and, you know, we've 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 offered explanations here every time somebody brings up the Fermi paradox. Like, oh, we'd see their footprints. Like, yeah, how come I don't see like, the, you know, the the East Indies company, you know, train tracks all over, you know, the United States, you know, like, well, guess what? You know, we got better ways. You know, it's one of those things where we, we look at our per current technology and our current way of viewing and when we imagine somebody who's more advanced than us, we just think they're sort of a bigger, richer version of us when they have like, you know, amazing technologies. You know, like imagine trying to explain to a conquistador, you know, about like, ah, I can't get Wi-Fi here. <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, and that's that's the mistake is, um, you know, that's that's why retro future is so uh, fascinating a genre to look at, because all they're doing is taking what they do now and just multiplying at times a bigger number, you know, like, uh, you know, pre automobile. When if you told somebody that uh, uh, that that, you know, Manhattan or, or New York would be 18 million people at some point, they would immediately say, you know, well, what do you do with all the horse manure? I don't understand. How do you how do you handle that? And they start going to work solving problems that don't even exist. So one of the theories about what happens like in the natural progression of technology when you start to build things, like there are certain things you look at society as they start to make. Like first, you live in a cave. You know, then you're like, well, I'll make, I'll make my own cave. You know, I'll make a little temporary structure with like wood and stuff like that. And then I'll make a semi-permanent one with rocks and stuff. And then, then I'll make more complicated caves with arch ceilings and doorways. And then maybe I'll make... I'll, I'll, I'll bridge one land to another land with a thing called a, a bridge, you know, and then you, you move forward. And I love onward. the fact that the, that the verb bridge existed before the it noun bridge. Yeah, right. it's a, I mean, why touch it? It's a bridge. Yeah, I mean, geez, let's not be dumb about it. Then, you know, it keeps going on. And then one, one person, one brave, brave person suggested like, well, let's think a little bit further out there. Freeman Dyson. You know, I know the name. I don't know. He's a mathematician, right? And a futurist and a, a smart guy? He may be a mathematician. He could be a physicist. Okay. Um, but, but theoretical this is, but, physicist yeah, and a mathematician. So, yay, we both win. This is, oh. uh, uh, by the way, this was why they called it a Dyson sphere in uh, Pandora's Star, right? Well, you just jumped the gun there. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> so he came up with something called a Dyson fear. So. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. Continue. Well, no, I mean, I didn't know if this is where you're headed. I just wanted to, to make sure. I always assumed that this was the, the reference in question when I, when I read that book. By the way, Pandora Star is an amazing book. You should really enjoy that. Um, but but uh, is that what we're talking about is the Dyson sphere? Yeah. Well, we're newer information. So that's one of the, the Dyson sphere. The idea is that you take a star. If you want to capture all the available solar radiation, you build a bubble. You build a shell completely around it. You seal it away inside of there. Right. So people who are looking for aliens, SETI and otherwise are like, well, if we want to look for super advanced civilizations, people that have the technology capable of, you know, just walling off their entire sun to consume all that solar energy, then what we need to look for Dyson spheres. Well, so and, and of course, the problem with that is uh, how do you, uh, you know, how, how do you look for something that, that has 
theoretically no energy signature and no it, leaking well, through. Would, there, there was a heat. There would be a. The, the theory was that there would be a heat signature, and the idea that you know you could do the math and say, okay, it would be you know like even a black hole gives off a signature. So, you know, assuming that it doesn't have perfect thermal efficiency, or whatever, then you could should be able to you know find some evidence, look for these little hot spots out there, and be like, oh wait, you know, you know what I think that is, guys. I think that's a Dyson sphere. I think I think we found it. You know, I think we found ancient, we found advanced civilizations there. Um, so that was a thing. But physicists, I mean, the scientists looked all over wherever they could try to figure out where maybe there might be one. Didn't find any, none, nothing. So therefore, there's no aliens. Just empty space. Where, I mean, this kind of stuff always seems a little weird to me because it's like whenever we're inventing the thing that we're sure the other thing that we don't know what they're doing like that's how we find them and it just like it, it's it's a cool thought exercise it's rad to talk about but it always just seems a little like uh i don't know a, a little too much chasing your own tail like well maybe they caught it guys because i have an announcement to make. wait what what no they didn't, no, they didn't find a dyson sphere no just oh He's down. Sorry. 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 <laughs> Dyson vacuum cleaner. That's right. They uh, actually got his biography right over here. Um, different Dyson, but yeah. So they, uh, some scientists um, looked at it and said, you know what? Like, what if we, what if they put it around a smaller one? What about like a white dwarf? What about a white dwarf? What if we just used a white dwarf instead of like a big earth sun? You know, what if we did that? You know, and that's like the a dim version after, our, you know, sun swells up feels like big, really proud of itself, and then explodes. But you have this little small white dwarf, and they said, well, the habitable zone is much smaller, much, much smaller, closer to that. So they figured, like, you would you would have a much smaller sphere, not the kind that we're looking for, and they could, you know, you could have, like, a one-meter-thick sphere built on the habitable zone of a white dwarf, right? And it would take 10 to the 23 kilograms of matter, which is, Brian and Justin are about to point out, whoever will be first, slightly less than the mass of our moon. So I was met a moon, I was... I knew you had it. <laughs> um, they say Dyson sphere cir encircling a white dwarf would also have almost Earth-like gravity. I assume if you stood on the outside of it. Wait, that's amazing. So, okay, wait. So, if it was a solid structure about Earth-like gravity, you're standing on it, and you just take that energy and use it to power streetlights <laughs> on on top. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah, trying to figure out like what what's the I mean, you could totally distance? ruin those, like, digging through the uh, center of the earth to go to China metaphors. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it'd be awesome is you build a, a Dyson sphere around a white dwarf and generations and generations pass. And then some and then finally this radical new theory comes up that what if the earth is hollow? And then it's like they they mount an exploration to journey to. Ah, there's a star in the middle of the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Um Let's kick. So I'm curious, like what they don't put in here is like, what, what is the habitable zone of a white, white dwarf? Because I'd be curious. Cause like, wouldn't it be awesome if it was like, you know, Jupiter sized or more or whatever. And you had that much surface area of a planet, but with earth like gravity. Yeah, man, there's a lot. I just typed in a white dwarf, um, Dyson sphere. And, uh, and I'm seeing a bunch of new articles. That I'm sure what you read on this, uh, Man, we're figuring this is a great – I'm really glad that we started this real estate podcast where we just talk about awesome new housing opportunities uh, <laughs> throughout the stars. It, it is kind of weird that it keeps coming back to that. It's called a theme, Justin. <laughs> it's great. No, I mean, listen, we have a very tasteful tutu uh, in a lava tube or we can uh, you know, get a nice little bachelor pad on a Dyson sphere. I mean, I guess that's the difference is we're not talking about academic interests in these things. We're picturing how we will live in them, you know? Hell yeah. Number one, like that is a way cooler idea of where you want to live, right? I mean, like it'd be cool to live in, it'd be cool to live on the moon on some level, but it's like, eh, is it as cool as living on a sphere that is encircling a white dwarf? No. So what about this? If you could live anywhere, anywhere in the galaxy, let's say, let's say that, that, that travel technology is, is, limitless you can cryogenically freeze yourself you can get anywhere relatively fast you pack Allegedly. up your family and you're just going to live the rest of your life in one place w w describe for me your fantasy space place to live justin you want i mean and i remember many long conversations with andrew about uh hollowing out 
asteroids. <laughs> like, I feel the like a hollow- my friendship. <laughs> feel like a hollowed out asteroid where it's like that would be rad. Like towns as asteroids, and then you know, like the high school from one asteroid would fly to the other asteroid to play football. Like that would be awesome. I I really love that actually. And then each one has their own laws. You go to Las Vegas asteroid. Then oh, meanwhile, yeah. you know, you go to to uh, I don't know an asteroid that lives like it's Victorian England or uh, oh hell yeah. And then there's one where it's like mandatory heroin use or something. Yes, and, like, yeah. like, hamster dance. Whatever the wants asteroid. an asteroid, man. Yeah, <laughs> we didn't hollow this out to be boring. Man, and that one asteroid that's like no, that's what we did. We we're all really boring. Uh, there, there's a cosplay asteroid where nobody's like, uh, the, you know, there'd be like a Harry Potter asteroid where it's like, they got, they got all this oh, dude. technology meant there's to, a, there's a play cause asteroid where everybody does Bill Cosby impressions. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing though. Imagine, imagine a world or, or, or an asteroid where they use advanced technology to simulate supernatural powers for everything. So it's like that you walk in and the first thing they do is they're like, welcome to superhero asteroid. Uh, here, we're going to outfit you with this, uh, this, this, you have to wear this hat all the time to monitor your neural impulses. And then, uh, and then you go into this city, they, they, they've created metropolis or whatever. And you just think, you know, like, levitate this object with my mind and it starts moving and of course what the, what it's doing is the computers are reading your thought you 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 want that to move yeah and so like you know hidden hidden mag live live technology causes it to move. number one there's no sentence that is uh, has been spoken that is more awesome in the english language than welcome to superhero asteroid please keep your hat on <laughs> here's your hat that would be dude a hat. I, I think I think there I think this is gonna be what we okay. Cause I wonder like what's the point? Where do we end up? What do we do once we have everything we ever wanted? I think that's what we do is we we can't actually go back in time, but we could create a nineteen eighties cosplay asteroid where they recreate down Manhattan, you know, down to the, the, the polluting I'm, cars and everything. In this in this one area, and let's, you could go and be in 1980s. Like, think about it like this: We live now in our culture in a very uh, fractalized culture in in America and the, and the Western world because of the internet. You can find and and ingrain yourself passionately in the smallest little niche and and kind of surround yourself in it. it it's it still blows my mind whenever people and me included talk about like. Oh, Twitter is going crazy about this thing. No, Twitter by and large is not going crazy about the thing you think that they're going crazy about. All your friends right. on Twitter are doing it. We, we have so tailored our own universe. And you know, when I think about you know, my family coming over from Europe like you know, only a few generations ago, uh, that at one point somebody was like, eh, you wanna know what, this sucks, I'm leaving. I'm going to the United States, deuces. Uh, can we be at that point now, like, or in the next like 50 years that what would be communities that are, you know, holding firm to, uh, you know, making sure that their voice is heard within our culture are then just like, eh, I mean, we could just live on an asteroid and just do everything that we want. So deuces, we are coming back to a deuces phase of human, uh, human culture. Exodus. Right? Yeah. You could just say, screw you guys. I'm going home. Well, that's one of the amazing things about uh, – I forget which podcast it was on, but they were talking about how we still very much see the echoes of the kind of people who come to America are the kind of people who, who are like, I'm going to take on massive amounts of risk. I'm going to abandon everything I ever knew just so I can – pursue this and whether it's you know the, the the vision of being rich or wealthy or successful whether it's the ability to you know practice your religion whatever way you want or or whatever your nutty idea is like uh, it, it's gonna take a few generations before that smooths out and becomes uniform with, to where you know uh, the United States starts to look like Eastern Europe well but even then it's like Let's say right now, you know, this whole thing that's happening in, in Indiana, right, with like the LGBT law thing and, and you know, everyone on Twitter, uh, he says hypocritically after he just made his point about Twitter, uh, is, you know, all up in arms about it. Like, you know, but 
let's say Indiana was its own asteroid. Like, I feel like we look at it differently. It's just like, yeah, all right, I'm probably not going to visit that asteroid much, but, you know, whatever, do what you want, get it how you live it. But well, and, and you know what will happen, right? And I, I guess we're, we're – that's interesting because that, that's, of course, what United States was supposed to be is each state – you know, everyone be cool. We're all our own asteroids here. And then slowly everything becomes federalized. Hey, uh, what are you doing to those people there with the chains around their necks? You're like, like oh, man, that's, that's, a, that's our business. That's a, that's a southern asteroid thing. Oh, <laughs> all, all us southern asteroids have different values. <laughs> it's vital to the economy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then... Uh, uh, at any rate, I would imagine that you'd see kind of a similar thing. You'd have, I think there would be this explosion of like crazy. <sighs> see, and I guess the other thing too is that that vision solves so many things because you really can be a pirate or a, or a, a trader, a merchant going from asteroid to asteroid. The way we picture Star Wars would be a very visceral, very true reality. You'd have people coming and going. You'd have a wide variety of different cultures that are only a short flight away from each other, you would have, uh, uh, you know... The well, th I mean, here's the thing to think about, too. When you talk about colonizing asteroids in the asteroid belt, is that you're, the, the distance around, you know, this is between Mars and Jupiter, the distance from one point to the opposite side of it is humongous. You know, so that you can have some that are close, but then it would be like, you know, traveling, you know, the furthest reaches of the solar system in some ways. Yeah, I guess so. Like one side of the uh, orbit or, or of the elliptical. Uh, yeah, I guess the orbit of the of the uh, thing. I mean, it's like it might as well. Like if you grow up on one side of the solar system, you just know that you will never, ever see the other side. Man, that, that's there'll be some like crazy explorer who's going to take a 20 year journey and he'll be like the Magellan who actually made a full lap through. The asteroid belt all the way but that's, around. I feel like like that's one of those like, you know, Manhattan, like how do you control all the horse poop arguments though, right? Like, like to yeah. even think of our current, you know, idea of travel and lifespan at the point where this kind of stuff is is a reality. I feel like, you know, we'll, this will all be in many ways subtly and in many ways radically different. Yeah. Great. I've been trying to do the calculations to find out how much surface area there would be on this. Uh, White dwarf? Yeah. So it, what, what um, did you find out about how far out the habitable, habitable zone is? Um, I got one estimate to put it at like uh, like a trillion kilometers. Uh, okay. I, I guess how many, how many in AU would that be? Uh Let's well, it would be smaller than an AU. It would be significantly smaller than an AU. Look, um, I love this. I love the fact that I could just go to Wolfram Alpha and say uh, 1 trillion km in AU. Which, which would be way more than AU, so that's the problem. I'm getting bad numbers here. Oh, yeah. No, that definitely comes up with 6,685 astronomical yeah. units. Uh, how many Philadelphias is it? <laughs> so, uh, I'll put width of philadelphia <laughs> welcome to our new uh, podcast G google it on wolf and alpha yeah look at that philadelphia is just one mile wide that's amazing wait really yeah it's less than a wait mars feature no sorry uh it's doing the mars feature apparently huh. there's a feature on mars called uh philadelphia no that was just that one time that they showed the film philadelphia yeah Huh. Per year. Crazy. <laughs> and nobody knows what's happening. Everything is going crazy here on Wolf from Alpha. Uh, <laughs> oh, Wolf from Alpha, you're drunk. He's giving, <laughs> just giving out gibberish. You're like, Philadelphia. Uh, oh, you mean on Mars? Uh, oh, my God. Would that be the best April Fool's Day ever if, if Wolf from Alpha, like, what has come to be, be known as, like, the most trusted uh, you know, snap your fingers resource for, uh, you know, big problem mathematics. Like all of a sudden it was just like, yeah, okay, well, here's your answer. But also it's a billion tulips. <laughs> it's amazing. I found, I found an answer. Okay. What'd you find? All right. One, about basically 1.5 million kilometers diameter. Uh, Okay, and that's okay. So one point five. It's million. yeah. They say white dwarf habitable zones like point one AU. Uh, point zero one AU. Point zero. Wow! Wow! 
So so if you were going to let's say let's say Dyson Sphere out of the picture, you spot yourself a white dwarf. You're like, yeah, it's a good spot. We're gonna throw up a little orbiting station here, um, and uh, we're gonna get really really close. I wonder I wonder how I wonder how much like our version of Earth it would feel like because it would have to, if you're gonna be that close, it'd have to be a small object. Be great hot water. Great. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh man, immaculate hot water. <laughs> so when you're think about this, Earth's diameter is like twelve thousand kilometers. Okay. Yeah. So if you have a Dyson sphere with a diameter of one point five million, so that's a thousand times the diameter of Earth, and then you go, you increase that by, you know, your your spherical formula. Um, what you're left with is if you're building up in it. So if you build your sphere, if you build your, your, your material all the way around your Dyson sphere, right? So you're going to have a planet that's got a thousand times the diameter of earth. Okay. When you talk about surface area and room to live on. Yeah. It's unlimited, right? I mean, it, I mean, virtually unlimited. It's, it's, it's how many earths would that be? Uh, here, let's do uh, crap. I can't figure that out. Dang it. We need math people to put it in perspective. Hey, How many Earths? Hey, math people. So, okay, imagine this Dyson sphere with an Earth-like gravity this size, a million and a half kilometers uh, uh, diameter. Um, we could do this number, but but we, I'd love somebody to send it in to us uh, or post it on uh, WeirdThings.com uh, Facebook. I, I, How many Earths could you map out on that sphere? How big could you make that? Is if we're not going to have an answer to that question. So no. <laughs> uh, you will person smart than <laughs> us and write into Justin Robert Young at gmail.com. Put weird things in the subject line or go to facebook.com slash weird things com and let us know what you came up with. Do you guys, uh, we got time for picks? Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. I'll, uh, I'll go first. Uh, last week we talked about, uh, how I was reading, uh, or I think my pick was Heroes of the Storm, uh, but I uh, went back to reading Contagious, which was a pick from Andrew, and uh, we we had talked about how it was based on or kind of picked up the mantle from Made to Stick, and so now that I finished up Contagious, I'm reading Made to Stick and uh, really digging it. It is a very direct, simple set of characteristics that these researchers have found with sticky stories and they start off with talking about urban legends that are patently false and yet so sticky that we can't get rid of them like the uh, the the kidney harvesting idea that uh, that you know you wake up and your kidneys taken or or the uh, the fact that there are zero recorded cases ever of a stranger poisoning candy and giving it out at Halloween uh, the only cases that ever existed are parents who uh, were poisoning their own children or or trying to, to like one was like an insurance you know uh, or cover up yeah you know, after the fact or whatever but it's like and yet that myth is so pervasive why is it that it's so very sticky and so he, he they break it all down uh, they got an acronym so it's uh, uh I'm not going to be able to remember it because I'm only halfway through the book but I'm enjoying made to stick very very much awesome uh I got two picks uh finished house of cards on netflix um i love house of cards uh you know i think there's there's you know i think reasonable people can have a discussion of you know comparing this season to to some of the past ones i very much enjoyed it and again it's a it's a show that i don't feel like i can be reasonable about just because how much my favorite sport is watching sociopaths be lists to each other and like that scratches that itch so completely. So great job on that. Uh, I very much enjoyed it. Check it out. And this weekend, if I seem like, I mean, it's fitting that we had so many space stories because I am right now a space cadet because I have been burning uh, the candle at both ends, uh, doing all sorts of wrestling stuff this weekend. WrestleMania is tonight. Uh, in fact, right after this wraps, uh, I'm going to be, converting the studio for our WrestleMania uh, live stream, which uh, so you can watch along with us on DiamondClub.tv. But I wanted to bring attention to a short film by Max Landis. Uh, you might remember Max Landis from, I think it was that one time on a Weird Things After Show where we got a friend of ours to put him on the phone for five seconds. 
but also probably more regularly uh, from the death and return of Superman short film that he did where he explained that comic uh, plot line and, and kind of made his own commentary on top of it on, uh, you know, why it was bad for comics, I guess, effectively. It was really well done. The sequel to that has been released. It's called Wrestling Isn't Wrestling. And this time, young Mr. Landis decides that he will take the 20-year career of Triple H, a famous wrestler, and discuss it as, it, as if it is, you know, long-form fiction. That this is one man's journey for 20 years and connecting the themes uh, of, of that stuff. It's, it's really, really fun. And, and I think you guys uh, would, would really enjoy it. That's awesome. By the way, and this is Max Landis, who we've had on our podcast, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is. Said that right? That's, uh, that's, that's kind of how he introduced him, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Welcome back, Andrew. Uh, hey, we're talking on, about man. Max Landis, who was on the podcast. I would have sworn you didn't say it like that. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, he said that uh, he, he mentioned yeah, how... A uh, friend of ours, yeah, put him on got, the phone. Put him on the for, phone for like five seconds in a weird thing. Did you say specifically on this podcast? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Said mm-hmm. it was a weird things after show because I believe it was a weird thing. Ah, after. I see. <laughs> what is happening? I feel like something important is occurring. What is this? What is that I hear? <laughs> what is that sound? What is that awesome ADS John Carpenter like music that's going through? The ether. Mm-hmm. That uh-huh. might have been why I was a little distracted. I was trying to find that. Gentlemen, <laughs> if you haven't seen it, you need to see it. Now, I'm going to tell you this. Some things are subjective. You're like, oh, I like this. Be like, oh, no, I, 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 was, I thought it was funny or whatever. I don't care. I don't care, okay? <laughs> Whenever you say, oh, like, I like this horror, mo- horror movie, people are like, oh, no, I laughed because I'm so brave that I laughed during this horror movie in the security of my own home cuz and it's like all right shut up okay i don't care all right like you know man, i'm not who, a are, you, who are you hanging out with man this guy sounds twitter, like a this real thing jerk twitter brian okay got okay. it everybody on twitter does that <laughs> when you when you say like oh have you seen this horror movie you're always going to be like oh it wasn't scary well no cuz it's a damn movie guys um, there's that weird thing, this reaction people have to have to have that. Meh. It's like, listen, I don't care. Like, I'm not, I'm not a guy that gets really scared when I watch movies. Okay, I may joke that I get really scared, but then again, every now and then I do. Maybe, not, maybe I will jump. Maybe I will be like, oh my god. Okay. Um, there have been, like, and I kind of tuned out of horror movies because it just got to be just torture porn, repetitive kind of thing where it's just like, all right, that bores me. There's not a lot there. I heard a recommendation of a book of a movie. My friend who I really, really respect is actually shooting a commercial for one of my my trigger clip. And, uh, and then I was hanging out with uh, Mr. Chris Kenner, a um, friend of ours, who, uh, by the way, has been on the podcast. You know who else has been on the podcast? Chris Kenner. He and was Max like, Landis. Did you know that? Yeah, no, uh, I, I did. Yeah. You, you did? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. We should have pointed it out. Um, <laughs> so I want to recommend Made to Stick. I think it's a great book. And All right, go ahead. So, uh... Anyhow, I went and saw this, and I loved it. It's a small little film. Now I'm gonna tell you, like, I mean, it's like they're like they're like like all right, this is this could silly, this could be done better or whatever. But overall, it was a great little film. I haven't enjoyed a little film like this in forever. It's called It Follows, which was supposed to go to video on demand last week, but because so many people liked it, they decided to do a wider theatrical release. Don't watch the trailer. Don't go to see the trailer. Don't look at it. Don't know anything about it. I knew nothing, and I enjoyed it. And I had somebody said to me, like, well, I watch a trailer. It doesn't seem that scary. Well, like, you're watching a damn trailer, you know? The less you know, the better. And it's not like Cabin in the Woods the sort of thing, which to me was like, I should have, you know, it would have been better if somebody told me this because then it would be like, all right, I'll, I'll enjoy it more, you know? But Cabin in the Woods was clever. But, no, it is clever in its very own way, tightly put together, shot against the backdrop of Detroit, which is – Frightening enough. Terrifying. Terrifying. I had chosen Detroit, and it's like, it's all the little things that just feel wrong. Stuff you just don't see. Like giant LED, uh, high uh, high fancy pants, expensive billboards that are just broken and left broken. Did you broken. see it? What's that? Have you seen it? Seen what? It, that, it follows? No. No, 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 no. Oh. No, okay. I'm talking about Detroit. So, and and it's it's done in this sort of this timeless sort of thing, and then they have things like, like there's not like... 
the, it, which is kind of cool. I mean, it, you can tell it could take place modern day, but they don't do a lot of things. It's not like, oh, you know, I'm getting texts and I don't know where they're coming from or whatever. It's about dealing with a scary situation, your relationship with your friends, whatever. The, the soundtrack is kick ass. I loved the soundtrack. And at first you're like, well, this is a little, and then you like, then you get into it and then you dig it. Um, don't expect a normal Hollywood sort of approach towards it. The director of this, by the way, let me get you his name. Um, I thought it was shot beautifully. I thought the casting was one. David Robert Mitchell, he's one to watch. I guarantee you, you're going to find out more about him coming out there. The casting, I thought, was really, really well done. Not since, like, you know, a Brian De Palma sort of thing. And a graduate of Florida State University, mind you. Who would have thought? thought. Uh, his last film was The Myth of the American Sleepover. So he, he likes good character stuff. So anyhow, that's one pick. And then I have another pick. And, and by the way, no genre fan, if we were to describe genre art as sci-fi, fantasy, and horror, no one suffers like the horror fan. The people yeah. that have that watch just the schlock that gets uh, you know, pandered to to do horror fans is is really uh, offensive and has been for decades. It is awesome when good horror comes out because when horror is good, there are few things that are better. And the the and just understand like it takes a premise we're all familiar with and whatever, but it's just the well done. The critics' reviews on Rotten Tomatoes are ninety five percent. Wow. Okay, Which and is insane because critics hate. Horror movies in yeah. general. Critics like so, dramas. They don't like comedy and they don't like horror. Yeah. And you'll get like super horror fans like, well, it's kind of like this or this is like, forget, like, like the premise is irrelevant almost. It's more about the characters and the cast and all the blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, that's one pick. Another pick. I know if you're like me and you've been thinking, like, man, you know, I like Mad Men. I like tech stuff. You know, I really, really like the idea of the Wild West days of the early 1980s when people are trying to build clean room environments and Chinese walls in order to re-engineer the BIOS operating system for PC desktops in order to open up that entire market and take it away from IBM. And I wish there was a drama that followed that. <laughs> are you serious? I wish. I mean, you're like, you're, you're with me, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> We've all been there. You know, because you're like, man, it's a fascinating point in time when, you know, the PC computer is just, just this this – amazing world-changing piece of technology and IBM Big Blue still controls a large part of the market all because of one chip one copyrighted chip that laws prevented people from just outright copying and then finally some brave individuals figured out that if they could you know figure out how to create an operating system that did everything without copying their code, then that would open up the market for clones and change computing as we know it and radically reduce the cost eventually the Koreans would take over the market for that period of time. It would be amazing. But who would be crazy enough to make such a show? This is awesome. What I have no. Wait, wait, is this a, a theatrical lease? What kind of? Where, where did you I, see I this? I think. I, I mean, I know that there was. I think is this the uh, Halt and Catch Fire? Halt and Catch Fire on AMC. Yeah. No. Season kidding. two starts next month. Season one. I'm halfway through season one, and it is a TV show about exactly that. About this guy leaves IBM, shows up at a computing company in Texas with the idea of like, let's reverse engineer IBM's operating system so we can create our own clones and uh, sets his company on a perilous course. So it's a uh, very interesting. It stars Ronan the Accuser, which Lee Pace, I, yeah. I look at it as one big Marvel one shot. Uh, and he is great, uh, uh, Lipe. So this is good. I, I, I really hadn't heard a lot uh, from it, which I took to mean that it was maybe not the best considering uh, the, the tech circles that I often find myself in. The fact that people weren't doing backflips for it, I thought, was maybe a negative sign. But, but you say good? Here, it's good. Now, here's the thing you have to have. Go you, you watch it and you're like, okay. Either consciously or unconsciously, there is a formula that they're following that they're maybe trying not to follow. And first off is Mad Men, another AMC show, is that he has this sort of Don Draper-esque sort of, you know, where is he from? What's his motivations and all that? And I think it leans a little bit too much on that. And I think that the other characters, uh, Mackenzie Davis, she's great. And I think uh, Scoot, uh, the other guy, they're all very interesting characters. I think the Mackenzie Davis character is maybe a little bit too, you know, Riot Girl you know, to almost make her too much of a cliche, but I think she's a great actress. So I think that we'll see where that settles in. That's my thing. It's like, man, it's like the, the very limited 
archetypes that people draw from. We need a programmer. Well, obviously, she's like a riot girl. You know, I'm like, well, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe women have many different points of view and opinions. And you yeah. know, you know, they don't have to have. Not everyone has to have these daddy issues that compel them. But anyhow, point is, still very well done. I, I'm enjoying it. I'm halfway through. And I think the biggest problem with with Halt and Catch Fire is the damn name. It's a clever name, but it's too clever. Yeah, it should be like Computer Show. <laughs> think of, think of Computer AMC. Wars. Walking, AMC, Walking Dead, Breaking Bad, Mad Men. <laughs> Halt yeah. and Catch Fire. What is this, like a military? No, no, it's it's about the halcyon days of the early 80s when they were trying to reverse injure IBM's boot chip. You know, Computer and- Cowboys. You're like, what you know i was like no yeah so i think that they need a a a better name maybe silicon dreams hey so uh i i gotta follow up on uh wait 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 wait. best thing right now free for another 10 days on amc oh the whole first season oh get it in your first season for free okay all right all right all right that's sorry there's an app um that sometimes sort of works which you can then Press play on the app and watch it on your Apple TV or you, your stream it, whatever, and you can watch it on your, your other device. You can watch it from the AMC website. So it is free. Uh, is it a Flixer? Is it a Netflixer? Usually AMC is pretty good about putting their stuff on, on, on the Flix. If it was on Netflix, I would have said it was on Netflix, Justin. <laughs> hey, Although, did you know that this, we had Max Landis on Weird Things a while ago? It was really amazing. <laughs> you guys point that out. Um, uh, in, uh, it's, they say it's free for 10 days. I don't know. And then probably it will end up on Netflix. But like, I, I'm not assuming anything. So uh, I, I have to amend my reaction to um, uh, Justin's pick from last week. Last week you picked uh, the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, and I, you know, sort of uh, indicated that it was just a little bit too structured of, of comedy for me. Let's um, go back. Here's the tape. Yeah, I'm Brian. <laughs> I don't think it's that funny. Yeah, and well, we're back live. Uh, I have I have watched uh, most of the episodes now because uh, it's 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 the kind of fair that's easy to put on with Bonnie because it's only a 22 minute commitment yeah. and so on. Uh, and there are, uh, it's still very hot and very cold. Like there will, there will be a very funny episode, uh, and then there'll be one that is just not funny or you know. But the universally the character I'm I'm in love with the guy uh, playing Titus. I think Titus is a fantastic character, and you notice that they they write the bit like I'm certain he got the gig based on his ability to monologue with himself in an entertaining and, and I don't want to say believable, but like you go along for the ride as he's chiding himself and, and trying to talk himself into, to, you know, yeah. having the courage to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, I just watched the episode where the, they reveal, and I don't want to spoil it, uh, but it's worth, you know, treating as a spoiler where they, re- where, with the trial uh, for the person who kidnapped Kimmy Schmidt and you find out who that is and you see him in action. Uh, I, I thought that, that was pretty good. Who like kills it. He just, just slays it, just murders it. And this uh, person needs to do more comedy. Because yes. Whatever he does, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Uh, agreed. Agreed. So I- anyway, I, 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 w- with reservations, I'll say I'm on board with uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, uh, j- just because it's like when it's bad, it misses the mark pretty, pretty far for me. But uh, yeah. but but if you don't mind rolling the dice, there are some pretty good gems in there. Um, I'm scrolling through Netflix, seeing what's available right now. I don't see a halt and catch fire. Uh, but oh, um, have you guys checked out? Um, it was the unbeatable, unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. <laughs> I was talking to Max Landis when he was on the podcast. He oh, recommended Rob, you know it. he was on the show. <laughs> what? Oh, man. We're going to be having this conversation. This is going to be a hilarious joke when we're in our lunar tube. Hang out. <laughs> I'm just going to point out, whenever I tune out, I'm only trying to find the next topic. Guys. I, yeah, I know. By the way, uh, tonight... By the way, I believe tonight is the premiere of the Scientology documentary on HBO. Oh, oh shoot. Okay. Let me double check on that. I, oh, um, my gosh. Yeah, no, I, th- I think it – yeah, no, that, 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 that's – No, it's, it's not on yet. I mean, it, it, it has not aired, been on it, so – Man, I might get HBO just in time to watch this. Um, It's Alex Gibney, right? I don't know. HBO Go says my flash is out of date. Guess what, HBO? <laughs> your flash is out of date. Uh, HBO. I think that's a great insult. No, your flash is out of date. Uh, yeah, so apparently I think that's on tonight. So that should be interesting. And, uh, All right. Can, uh, it'll be a great WrestleMania post show, folks. You got yourself a nice little Sunday. 
Heck yeah. All right, guys. Uh, someday I'd like to get Max Landis on here. <laughs> I'd love to have him on. You know, the thing is, is my information. Oh, God. Nothing's more embarrassing getting called out on that. <laughs> it's, been, it's been weird. Shut up. Shut up, all of you. Beautiful. 66 minutes, 32 seconds, Neshcom. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, hey, um, uh, I, I, I know you've got to run, Justin. Uh, I, 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 can, I can do maybe a super short after things or... Uh, I don't know what 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 we have to to yeah, talk Yeah, unfortunately, on. I got people coming over, so I got to start building this studio before it gets more packed in here. Um, but well, I'm committed. Mm, mm, committed to the bit. All right, Joe. Now, see, look at this. Luckily, I may not know about freaking Max Landis appearances. <laughs> I love you guys, you said, but when? Bye, uh, Justin. Uh, well, here I'll, I'll run to the restroom real quick and. Uh, um, not if I go first. Oh, dog got it. So I'm just going to leave it running right now. Uh, in the meantime, we can play this stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh. What? Meshcom thinks that's not how I wrote this. Did you wash your hands? I did. I do. <laughs> All right. There we go. Uh, let's, let's get talking after. All right. All right. Here we go. We're at 69 minutes, Neshcom. Take it away, sir. Welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Uh, yes, and of course, Justin Robert Young is right here. Oh, no, he had to run. I'm not keeping score, but I think you're, <laughs> think you're in the lead with Justin and Brian After yeah, Things. We, we should start After Things with, a, with an attendance roll call. Brushwood, yes. Brian, here. Uh, what, Brian. What's on your mind, man? See the smile on my face? Is is that because you're you're, you're printing money with your crazy uh, 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 evil scientist lab of of robots making other robots? Um, actually, I stopped the printers for like a week and a half because I had to finish up a writing project, and I didn't want to be constantly like tweaking and doing that. Oh, dude, that's got to be like a seductive black hole of your attention because there's, oh my there's God. all because it feels like work. Like for me, it's it's. For me, my version of that is uh, managing the comments on YouTube and responding to tweets because each one yeah, is very little little amount of time, and you get that little you know oh look at me I'm I'm managing my social brand I'm working I'm working and meanwhile you know it's great because it feels like you're getting stuff done and meanwhile the important projects are just sitting there mounting up and then meanwhile like I get I got a I got an email from. Uh, Mark Fronfelder of Boing Boing, um, who is like one of the biggest guys in like the maker movement and all that, asking me to be on a show tomorrow, which is kind of like finding out like if you're into making and building things, like you've been asked to go like on the Tonight Show. You yeah. Know? Oh, sure, sure, absolutely. That's the sweet center of the universe in that. And how did that come up, uh, come on your plate? Because people, uh, I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who have projects and they'd like to make it onto various podcasts. Uh, I think that what happened here with 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 uh, Fronfelder was that, uh, and I'm pronouncing his name wrong. I'm sure, um, I, but I read it all the time. Uh, 
I know we have a we have a friend or two in common, and I think it may have just been that my name came up a couple times. But it, know, but it happened it, totally organically, huh? It totally just out of nowhere. I just hey, I'm email. I'm like, oh wow, that's amazing. But that's how I'm smiling. I mean, I'm smiling because of that. I'm smiling. You know, I'm smiling, Brian. Why? Because once we finish this podcast, I'm gonna get in my car. I'm gonna go to my favorite foot massage place. Get my foot massage, mm-hmm. maybe a little shoulder massage, mm-hmm. all on the up and up, guys. Okay, so you know. Um, and then uh, I'm going to get myself a barbecue sandwich. They get this really good barbecue sandwich at Spring Street Smokehouse. Okay. They got this like melted Guillard cheese that goes over. They drizzle it on there. It is amazing. Like, Andrew, that's, that's conspicuous consumption. Why are you so happy about that? <laughs> maybe you're happy because it's such conspicuous consumption. Or maybe it's a little victory lap. Uh oh! What happened? What victory are you celebrating? Maybe I finished a book. What? Which? And I don't mean listening to a book or reading a book. Yeah, yeah. You're like, why didn't you make that your pick? <laughs> um, I finished the first draft, mind you, of a of a children's book, a middle grade story I've been working on. Oh, right, like, a, like a young adult thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, more middle grade than young adult. And like, I will go into the differences at some point if you you know if anybody wants to hear that. But uh, it's been a passion project. I had to take a sideline to go finish Name of the Devil. By the way, you can pre-order right now on Amazon. What's um, the release date on that? Name of the Devil is July, and I'm going to tell you a little. I think I may mention this before. We're going to have like a little Name of the. De- There's going to be an Angel Killer short story coming out featuring Jessica Blackwood before then. Oh, that's so, great. There's the cover. Oh, well, wow, they did. <laughs> Um, my publisher said that we were going to do a cover reveal. I guess they did. <laughs> uh, and we, I stole it. <laughs> like, oh uh, I scooped them. That's hilarious. I got to ask about that. Like, ah, remember we talked about doing a whole social media cover reveal? That's hilarious. Um, that is hilarious. Uh, the paperback uh, has not that. Yeah, that is hysterical. Um, uh, so anyhow, you can pre-order that. And actually, it's actually been doing... The 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 pre-orders on that it's actually really I mean it's not like a great number but it's actually I'm surprised that it's, it's well so doing. now if I we talked to Scott Sigler about this for like what it takes to get on New York bestseller list and all that stuff and apparently pre-orders it's like a rubber band snapping on the day of release right so it's like pre-orders uh, it doesn't matter if you pre-order a month in advance a week in advance the day in advance the day it's released is when all the pre-orders are executed and it shows up on that day and hopefully rockets up to number one, right? That's what I'm told by my publisher. So if you want to if you want to just make sure that you can count it on that first day or whatever, pre-order it now. That's, yeah, that's... I just clicked, uh, oh, and if you're logged in, you can pre-order with one click. I just did the one click pre-order. That was very Thank easy. Thank you, Brian. Dude, that's great. Uh, uh, appreciate it, everybody. So yeah, that's that's as far as I know. But anyhow, I just finished this other, this kid's book. It's a full-length novel. Um, I'm excited about it. It's got a character that I really, 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 really love and hold dear to my heart that I can't wait to share with other people. Um, But it was one of these things where it just, everything got in the way of trying to finish this book. Like, I got, you know, 10,000, 15,000 words into it, then all of a sudden, name of the devil, you know, the uh, manuscript for that fell onto my lap and I'm like, okay, I need to work on that. I spent several months going over that. Um, my fantastic editor, Hannah Wood, gave me tons and tons of notes and a lot of things to work on it to try and make it better. And we already got our first advanced review on it, which was ecstatic. So that was oh, good. That's but anyhow, great. So then uh, I had to go do that. And then that was a long process to do that. And then after I did that, then I had to do a second round. I got a little writing I'm like, oh no, we need to do this fine, this other check of, of it, right? I'm like, okay, I do a little more writing. And then I start, then all of a sudden I get this is like the galley version of Name of the Devil that I had to go through there. And, do, do, do you hit a point where it's just hard to want to read your words again? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, you know, I joke that, like, because, you know, I can write a book in a week, but, like, to edit it, it takes three months, which maybe tells you that I should, you know, spend less, spend a little, you know, spend more time writing them. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's funny. I got this galley thing, and the first thing I did is I said, well, I have my green M&M test. For the book, the green M and M test was, I think, uh, was it a San, uh, oh uh, 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 Van Halen? Van Halen's uh, yeah. contract writer said uh, said uh, no brown M and M's, and and so people would have to pick through it because they knew that there was no way to uh, to uh, to buy them pre done yeah. that way. So they would show up and they would look at the, and I believe 
it was uh, David Lee Roth's idea uh, because yeah. he, you know they, they knew that if there were no brown M and M's in the in the jar, then uh, then everything else was likely to be not a yeah, total. Yeah, there's a way show. to tell. Like, did they read the fine print? So my 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 I swear to you, my fine print is: Did they get the Diamond Club logo right when I do my special thanks? Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> First time they did that, I looked. They left out the symbol oh that's awesome and so now the first thing is like well, let me see if they got that. nope they got it right so they got that absolutely right and also like having we had when i did my new york talk we had some diamond club members come out and meet and so that the, the harper collins publicity people who i love you know gotta meet in the flesh actual diamond club people so that was great oh that's great so so, so they understand like there's a difference between being told like no there's a passionate fan base this community they can move mountains mm -hmm. you're like yeah, yeah yeah but it's like when you see them show up boots on the ground is what matters yeah, absolutely. So I finished this this first draft, and I emphasize first draft of this story. Um, it's about a goblin. I'll tell you that. Oh, right on. Oh, we did. We have talked about this in the past. Yeah, tonally, it's between Lemony Snicket and Harry Potter. It's not a magical world. Um, you know, in an Andrew world, I have written some other young adult or kid stuff that's got kind of more magic based. But anyhow, I'll, I'll explain it later on. But. Finally, I finished it, and part of the way I had to motivate, like I had, like last week, I'm like I looked at time frames, I looked, I had reasons to try to finish this thing, and then I had a friend come into town, and I'm like, and I had to hang out, I want, wanted to hang out with the person, I don't get to hang out a lot with them, and so I hung out with my buddy, and then it was one of those things where that weekend that I was supposed to do this and finish up, I didn't get to do it, and you know, life gets in the way, and I'm like, I don't have a wife, I don't have kids yet that I know of <laughs> in this country that I'm legally paying support for, uh, and so. I can only imagine how much harder it is for other people to find the time, but I found the time. I finally said, you know, Friday, I said, okay, I had to take care of something in the middle of the week, a really cool project, which maybe I'll have more to talk about. But anyhow, I said Friday, like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to give myself this really super big, ambitious, like, you're going to write. You're like, I've done, you know, like, when you've done like 17,000, 20,000 words a day, it can set a very unrealistic expectation for yourself, mm -hmm. you know, in some situations. So I just said, okay, I know, I know, like, I can do it, you know, doing a chapter of sitting. I'm like, okay, do two chapters Friday, do three chapters Saturday, and then do two chapters Sunday, and I'll reach the end, and then I'll be ready to go back and revisit with the. You and know, that's that's the, the toughest thing, man. Is is uh, and we've talked about this before. Like for me, the best advice I ever got for writing a book is turn off the monitor because you stop editing as you write, and instead you you know you just write knowing that you'll go back and fix things later. Mm -hmm. It's important to finish so then you can start revising. Yeah, and I'll touch on that. I have a thought on that too. Is and so I said that's what I'll do. And so I did. I did my two two chapters Friday and I actually way exceeded the words that I needed to do. And then Saturday I, I did my, I did two chapters and then I took a little lunch break and then I'm like, you know what? I'm kind of excited about writing the rest of this, wrote it. And I said, okay, I've got these other parts I can save till tomorrow. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do them. I'm going to do them Saturday. So I finished it Saturday, finished the, that version of it. And again, like I know where I need to go back in there and do stuff and say like, oh, this, but I finished the, the stories there. The story's on paper. I have my first draft of it. I'm excited about it. I may be the only person in the world that loves the story, but that's fine. And now I'm like, okay, now I get to take a break, you know, and I'm ready to jump right into it. But I'm at that point where I have it and I love it. And so I felt very good, but it came down to, for me, was just figuring out, disciplining myself and saying, okay, just do this much this day. You know, writing a book is not hard. Writing a book is not hard for anybody. Sometimes you have to do a different pace than other people. You have 365 days in a year. To write a novel, we'll call it 60,000 words. You know, if you write if you write 8,000 words a day, which is an hour, that's 60 days. That's two weeks, two months rather. Two months you can be done. If you can find a Saturday or Sunday there to spend a four or five hours, it happens a lot faster. It's just the hardest part isn't finding the time. It's putting yourself back in the seat. And oh, yeah. That. <clears throat> yeah. Beginning is the most difficult thing. Um, there's a, 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 a Anthony Robbins story where he's talking about uh, trying to motivate an um, older woman to lose weight and start exercising. Like she really wants to do it, really wants to do it. He's like, OK, just just walk, you know, just walk for 10 minutes a day or whatever. And then she uh, uh, she wouldn't do it for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then finally, uh, he says, OK, you know what? Let's just drop the bar. All I want you to do is just put on your jogging clothes. That's all, you don't have to run. Just put on your jogging clothes and then uh, wear them for five minutes and then take them off. That's, let's start with that. And then the next time, you know, next week he sees her, 
And uh, and he's like, so did you put on your walking clo- dro- dro- jogging clothes? And she's you know cuts him off as like you're like I went twelve miles a day or however long like because once she had committed, once she had put on the tracksuit, it felt ridiculous to not do anything. Like she had begun, she was already on the other side. Absolutely, and that, it's funny because that's that's an example I used for myself with working out. Was like I have these shorts that I go wear when I go walk. I just put on the shorts, put on the shorts, and like that. All right, and that's that's the the. And we, and you know, as we've read more and more about why we're motivated, you understand so much. Like when you have to make eight decisions about something, mm-hmm. you just lose your resistance and you want to avoid it entirely. And when we think about a task and we think the enormity of the task, we give up. You know, if I said, you know, said Brian, go save the world tomorrow. You'd be like, uh, where, do, where do I begin? Right. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm like Brian. Um, just be nice to people. To you know, say hello to one person tomorrow. You know. Oh, well, that I can do. For me, it is. I need. I need three things. Uh, I, I, aside from my master plan of where the book is going to go, I need to tell myself to sit down, open up Scrivener to a blank page, and then with that chapter, have a clear idea of the conflict and have some sort of starting hook. Where does it start? Where is the center to begin this thing from? If I have those things, it's super easy. Everything flows. I stop writing. I reach hesitations when either I'm, I'm a little bit, the map is too fuzzy and I don't know how to get to where I need to go. The solution for that is just jump ahead. That's yeah. always the solution. I've had that happen several times. I just jumped ahead and I went back. Just, just draw a box and write, something happens here and now we're there. And often you find mm-hmm. out you don't need it. Often you find out that you know maybe you need a little bit of just a clarification, but often the story can be even tighter because you didn't spend that, waste that time connecting things. Which often in movies it gets tedious because like yeah 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 we know this part here you know we know what's going to happen here. So one is I just say okay you know if I have my plan I have that sit down open up Scrivener which you're writing open up that page start with that and if, I, if I'm stuck trying to figure out the right way into it I get up I go for a walk and I just tell myself all I have to do on this walk is just figure out, you know, what's the center point of that scene and the conflict and where it ends. And then, boom. So, feeling very happy right now. Of course, I will go through the normal. Speaking of which, uh, I, I, I'm sure you want to edit it, uh, but if you're looking for uh, someone who might want to test read, I don't know, maybe an 11-year-old girl who reads everything voraciously, Maybe she's on her sixth lap of uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy because that's her new assignment uh, at her school. I don't know if I can handle that well of an informed critic, Brian. Uh, I don't know if I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, she will she will chew it up in two days. And uh, in fact, I I what I should do is not even tell her that it's yours. Um, yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Yes, I'm nervous about that. <laughs> Terrible nervous. Um, uh, yeah, no, she's she's the demo, and she is. Uh, I mean, she'll. I, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I she uh, would probably. I love to. What is she like? What books has she liked? Oh man, she'll give you that list. Uh, yeah. So many, but I mean, you know, she she read, you know, the the, the Giver and the, uh, uh, I don't know, just all all. Because here's the thing, like in my research and reading a lot of a lot of middle grade, a lot of books, um, I have found that like. Some of the most popular ones are not well written. You, like you compare, and I don't want any names, but they're like series that like are extremely well sold well. But you pick them up and you go, man, this is like, this is like. I mean, I think Harry Potter is very well done. I think J.K. Rowling really grew with her writing. And I've read other stuff, and I go, wow, this is the plotting is just all over the place. This is really written for a twelve-year-old boy. Just to throw this thing here, this thing here, this thing here, and it doesn't hold up. And there's a reason why kids talk about this book and not adults and stuff. And so it's all over the place. And that's the thing that has me like, man, I don't. It's curious. It's it's a interesting. Now I'm going to talk about. We you mentioned before the idea of you know preparing yourself for going back to it and redoing it, and that is absolutely important. It, you know, writing is not a get rich quick scheme. Writing is not a let me just di- do this then walk away from it. And that is where bad writing comes from. And I would have people often go to me like, "Oh, take a look at this." And I'm like, "No human should be looking at this yet." Nobody, you know, like why are you like there there may be something good here, but there's so much awful that, you know, you can't see it and you have to prepare it. And sometimes people just give up on it and they're like, "Oh, you find the value because I've given up on it." Well, that nobody will. Marvel has a great track record with movies. You know, you look at the Marvel now. track record. The, the, what, yeah, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now, absolutely. How do they get good? And you look back at some of the bad Marvel movies and you had some of the same people involved, but they learned. 
every Marvel movie, they budget for reshoots. They go into it knowing they're going to come back for a couple weeks and shoot additional scenes. And often, you know, other film companies, other studios, most of them, no, they never do that. They'll be like, okay, we're going to spend $80 million on this. Like, what if we need to fix it? Well, no, you have to, we have $80 million. Got to get it right the first time. Doesn't happen. Doesn't work that right. You, you pray for a miracle. Marvel says, no, we, we, we expect it. Get it right the first time, and then we'll look at it, and then if we can make it, we'll find a way to make it better no matter what. Right, right. So the question is, is either this money that's set aside will save the film or it will improve the film. But regardless, we're, gonna, we're going to see uh, mm -hmm. a, a more Marvel, more polished product as a result of setting this aside. You know, and Pixar. So Pixar has their approach where they talk about plussing. So Pixar takes this, they take a story and they, you know, the cheapest thing you can do is just put words on paper. That is the cheapest way to start a story. And then before they ever start having, turning on, cranking the computers away to start animating stuff, they've tested that story over and over and over again until they think, yes, we have it. Then they start to make it and then they keep going back and going, what could be better? What do we need to improve? And that's a, it's a long, long process, but it's why most Pixar movies, you know, stand the test of time. They're great. They've had... They've been attacked from every point of view. How do you make it better? How do you plus it? And so, you know, your goal as a writer is, and my goal is like, okay, let me tell the story. Let me create the character. Now let me go back. And my first, like my first draft is going to be, what are all the little threads that I need to tie up? You know, it's not just how to, and the first draft isn't just like, I don't consider it just, oh, it's the version I haven't edited. It's, there's a lot of little things. And later on in, in the book, I'm like, oh, you know what? It'd be interesting if I pointed this out about a character here. Or I have an unnamed person that does something here that's not a major character, but I can put them back here and assign something to them. Or, okay, this is much more clear. So there are all these little things that you should think about. So Yeah, man. Um, oh, doggone it. Uh, I'm actually looking at the time. I think we're about to start dinner. Uh, mm -hmm. We could do a couple more minutes, I guess. Massage and barbecue. Any questions we have in the uh, the chat room? Anybody want to know? That's a good, that's a good one. Uh, by the way, Spearman Nitrate points out that there, there were like 30 animat animatics for uh, Toy Story. I actually had a whole bunch of, uh, of, of health and diet stuff I wanted to chat with you about, but uh, I'm afraid that it opened up more time. Is that uh, a hint? No, my, my, what? No, 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 no. For, for, for me, because uh, like I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I, I did really well for, for uh, uh, January, mid January through uh, mid February. And then I went out on the road and then South by Southwest happened. And I basically just undid all of the good work I had done. So I'm, I'm back to having, you know, that bounce is completed. And so now I'm starting like just to shake things up, like a, just a two week highly restricted uh diet and uh you know whatever exercise i can manage like like i'm basically factoring in now that i'm gonna be too tired to even try to run like i'm i'm gonna say i'm gonna write if i walk for an hour that'll count but the uh uh the reason i was thinking about it is uh i don't know if you've uh ever listened to penn sunday school but he's been talking about his weight loss and uh the the work of ray cronies the uh uh, the uh, basically chill your body to burn more calories thing where, um, uh, you know, wear a vest made of ice and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, have you read anything about that? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I've read some stuff about like even like what the difference is of eat, drinking really cold water and, 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 and yeah, sure. In the long run, it's stupid. You know, I mean, and being, being the point of view that, is this something you're going to do? Is, is this a lifestyle five? that you're going to do yeah, for the rest of your life or whatever? Now, whatever. Yeah. And like the biggest changes that I made that lo that stuck the thing. And you've, you've read more about like, you know, how habits form and stick and all that. You finished that book. I kept <laughs> Yes. Um, the biggest changes in my life were one was switching to diet soda from regular soda. And, and we can make an argument that should get off a of soda entirely, but, but, but again, there's, uh, there, there's, there's the perfect and then there's the good, right? Yeah. And then you're like, Oh, but you still can be up there. It still has count. I'm like, yes, but it's less, it is less than regular soda. I watched myself drop like eight pounds when I made that switch, when I switched and this is, you know, granted I was, you know, this is, I was, you know, and by the way, again. how, how quickly do you adjust to, if not liking, then, you know, possibly preferring, the one like I'm at the point now where it's like I I dislike the feeling on my teeth of sugared sodas at all. Oh yeah, no, I'm the same way. Like yeah, I my dad would always drink Diet Coke, and I'd be like, how can you drink this? It's battery acid. And then then when I realized like man, I, I looked at how many cokes I consume today, I'm like, wow, that's 500 calories right there that I don't need. And so 
I what I did was it really happened at Outback Steakhouse. I just order a diet coke with my meal, and I would only and I would only drink it when I had food, and so I was not just paying attention to it. You know, and so that was a big change for me. Like I noticed that like it was easy. I was easy. It was just an easy five pounds gone. Just just you know, in a few weeks of just doing that, then to lower my soda intake, um, I don't have soda in my house. Oh, every now and then I might bring a bottle home with like. I mean, the the dark side of how Andrew finished his book was Andrew has an addiction, and and Andrew sometimes to get himself to sit down at the keyboard has to like take a very he puts a bag of Skittles there <laughs> <laughs> to lure himself. <laughs> Andrew may have consumed a thousand calories of Skittles Friday night. Um, wow. Uh, but anyhow, I, I will, I, you know, thing to cut down my soda consumption is I stop keeping soda in the house. So now I have, uh, I'll go out to eat. I'll drink soda. I'll drink that. Now I'm trying to like, I don't drink it like after like nine o'clock or whatever. So that was a big thing, but I'll drink like a lot of diet Coke when I go out to eat, which is not good. But now now the next step is, I have a big glass of water when I take my soda cup and I go to the fountain, I fill it with water before I drink my soda, which lowers the soda. Because you don't want to be drinking soda when you're thirsty, mm -hmm. you know, because you want to be drinking water. So anyhow, that was step. So biggest factor that affected me, switching away from sugary drinks to diet beverages, mm -hmm. big, huge effect. I was finding myself in the middle of the day extremely lethargic, very, very lethargic. Wait, and I'm sorry, I, say, that, say that again? Lethargic. No, 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 no. Wait, in what situation are you lethargic? Middle of the day. Just oh, middle of the day and be like, maybe I need a nap. And I'd be like, yeah, I've been sitting around all day. Yeah, it was really hard day. That's time for a nap. And what I started to do was I would get up and I'd go to the park and I would walk for an hour or two, two hours. And I got into the habit of every day going for a long walk. It did wonders. One, for my health, that was another five or six pounds was easier to keep off doing that. Was boom. That was That solved that problem. Creatively, my most creative work has happened when I'm out there just walking and thinking, and that was a wonderful thing. That was the thing that I still do to this day. I try to walk at least three miles a day every day. Like, like that is my my average for so. Like, looking at my average has been yearly average has been that. After like Thanksgiving or something like that, I'll go. I've done, you know, ten miles a day or whatever. And I love it when I find a really good audio book because then I don't pay attention to the time. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, actually, my daily average for the year is three and a half miles a day. There's a, there's a, uh, I think this week's, maybe it's last week's, uh, Freakonomics episode is where they talk about um, bundling, you know, uh, good, uh, or, you know, satisfying things with things that you know you ought to do. And and uh, they interviewed uh, people where they used audiobooks as the way to lure people to the gym. They took students, uh, they're like, uh, you here's the, here's your audiobook that you're listening to. You can only listen to it while you're at the gym. And then they tracked how often they, they, they showed up. And uh, in some cases, they made it to where they couldn't physically listen to the book unless they showed up. Other times, mm -hmm. they gave them the iPod and said, just try to only do it when you do the one thing. And um, it's fascinating stuff. Dude, you look at the total running time of the how Star Wars conquered the universe. All of that was that, spent walking. That, all that was spent walking. Yeah. And so I'm a big believer in that. So I would say diet – the, the diet drinks was a big help. Walking was a big help. But another big thing for me was like I, I, I like I have a sweet tooth and I have that. A big change up for me health wise is uh, I hate vegetables. I'm not a fan of vegetables. But like I go to uh, – there's a place called Daphne's California Greek. I ate there like every day and like I get like a double help in their vegetables. They're really good. And so I tell myself – I don't tell myself I can't have this or I can't have that. I don't get into that. Oh, I'm dieting. I can't do this. I just – you know, there's much better – word choice of I don't do this is much better than saying I can't. But then I say, okay, I'll, I like, I like Panda Express. So what do I do when I go to Panda Express? I don't get the rice. I don't get the noodle. I get a big, huge heaping helping of vegetables. I still hate broccoli. I still hate them. I force myself to eat it all. And then I dig into my orange chicken or whatever. And it takes, it makes a, what for many people is a 2000 calorie meal into a 700 calorie meal for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Well, so anyway, uh, uh, I'm starting a two week kind of reboot to see. I want to see how drastic. I mean, almost to fasting levels. I want to see if it's possible to clock in at under a thousand calories and yeah, still work out. I think it's an interesting experiment, but like, I don't like. I know I can go from where I am to my optimum, like 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 the best ever I've been in like five weeks. I know that if I want to go like in mus muscularity, whatever. I know I know in two weeks I can lose. 
you know, I could probably lose 10, 15 pounds without looking like I was surviving radiation. But I'm just, I, I, the problem with those sort of things, they don't solve the long-term problem for me. No, they, and, and, it, and it wouldn't be a, I mean, the sustainable thing is to, you know, have, uh, I mean, the habit of exercise is now built in. It's um, mm-hmm. uh, what, what I need to do is, I mean, partly because I got, I got a, a gig in two and a half weeks, so that it would be pretty rad if I was three to four, five pounds lighter for um, and then oh, that's easy. You can do that. That's yeah, no problem. Yeah. I mean that, but, but the, the biggest thing is I, I need to, um, cause my biggest problem is I have a really hard time falling asleep. So I tend to, I, t- I tend to uh, drink beer late in the evening and then, you know, in order to get tired enough, you know, if, if, especially if we're doing like night attack or whatever, and it's like, you know, a beer an hour for five, six, seven hours straight adds up to a lot of beer. And, uh, uh, just that, that sort of natural unwinding flow has to be broken. You know, I, I, like I talked to Bonnie, I'm like, look, you know, for the next two weeks, it's going to be no booze, you know, around a thousand calories a day. And it, now understand a side effect of that will be, there will be some night that I'll lay in bed. I'll go to bed at midnight and I will not fall asleep until four in the morning. And how, how much do you pay attention to your sleep hygiene? Um, I, 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 a lot, a lot. I mean, part of the, the problem is I, it's inherently difficult to do the things that we know are associated with sleep because what, what matters is you should have regularity, which is difficult when, you know, two nights a week I've got, you know, uh, live streaming things and occasionally there's, a, there's an on-the-road show where, mm-hmm. you know, it's like and you, when you come off of a performance at 1030 and you pack everything up and now it's 1130, you finally make it back to the hotel or you finally shut everything down. You can't just be like, and now let's go to sleep. So it's like it's it's inherently variable. You, you know about the whole no electronic screens and all that. Yeah. Stuff about yeah. The light. I, I, I and and uh, that's the biggest thing is, is I think what I'm going to do over the next two weeks, uh, again, as part of the whole lifestyle snap around thing is I'm going to I'm going to it's been years since I've made a habit of reading before I go to bed, uh, an actual book book. So I, I'm going to sit and start reading a book because what I have been doing is always audio books. But uh, mm-hmm. at any rate, so yeah, that'll be, uh, I'm going to try good sleep hygiene um, and figure out if, if I can kind of break that reliance on, uh, on having beers to get me tired <laughs> to go to bed. Sounds like a good plan, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for for a whole bunch of reasons. Brian, I see a book in the writing. Um, <laughs> how how I stopped drinking beer hey, and everything hey, was awesome. Yeah, not so many beers to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, uh, I, yeah. No, and and if and if anyone if anyone hasn't had insomnia, uh, man. It is. It is brutal. I mean, you. I, I mean, it is. I am very aware that that is not a healthy lifestyle choice. But uh, if it cuts five years off my life, but I spend more of it sleeping well, then that's fine. It's like it's sitting there, especially when you get your head caught in space, like uh, laying in bed, especially when it's and it seems to strike when it's most important. For you to get good, good sleep. Like, I got to get up. I got to sleep. I got to sleep. And you can't. And you're just caught in that loop. It's miserable. I, it, if it's not the caffeine that keeps me up, it's the stress about like, oh, if I got everything figured out, you know, and like my reassuring thing, my safe place is I get up and I go look at a spreadsheet. <laughs> oh, really? Like to, uh, to, 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 to let you know that everything's Map all right. Out, you know, projects, income, all that sort of stuff. I'm like, okay, I know this is working on, I know this is, I'm doing this. And like, yeah, no, I know I'm worried that, you know, what's going to happen in March of 2016, you know, I need to be worried about, you know, what projects are going on there, but sitting down, going to look at my spreadsheet and going, okay, this is here. What, oh, I need to be sleeping right now. You know? And that, that's the thing I often do is cause you get that panic at night. Cause you're just, you're like, oh my God, you know? You're well, and, and that's that's part of the reason that I want to do this, you know, kind of really intensely for the next two weeks is because there's nothing that's hypercritical. Like, like if 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 I do have one of those nights where I can't fall asleep until four a.m., I could put a note on the door, and Bonnie will know to uh, do her best to let me sleep in until you know ten or whatever to get that sleep. Yeah. yeah. So I don't right. know, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I'll I'll report in next week. Yeah, I didn't go to bed till six this morning. God, so jealous. Kids changes I, all no, that. No, not man. that I, I just was just that finished the book and then I don't know, maybe, maybe somebody had themselves a big piece of red velvet cake and a chocolate chip cookie. You, know? <laughs> you and I have very different vices. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh Igloo, you know, that's an interesting theory on how you go to sleep. And I always like always thought like, man, you know, 
<laughs> you know, I, I want to see the clinical research on that. <laughs> uh, right on. Uh, all right. Well, hey, uh, uh, speaking of food, I believe there's some waiting for me downstairs. All right. Goodbye, y'all. There we go. Saving this. Mm -mm -mm. Do we have an episode title or? Oh, uh, um, <laughs> I was thinking we should call the weird things Max Landis. <laughs> uh, so oh, wait, somebody had a, a lava tube joke they made. Um, tubular. We can call it tubular. Tubular. Okay. Got it. Uh, tubular. We should call the after things cross fat. <laughs> cross fat. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got to consider if I want to get. Oh, you know, what? I could just borrow someone's HBO Go login. Mm. I really want to watch that clear thing. In fact, I'm going to text uh, one Ace Detect and see if we want to commit to that for tomorrow. Uh, Tom I love Tom. Merritt. Oh, wait, he's he's up uh, He's up at the Buzz Out Loud thing. Ball? Mm. It is so amazing how that was the show that I introduced Justin to to be like, for podcasting, you know, we should watch, the, see what these guys do. And so, like, we, we started off as fans of Buzz Out Loud. That's awesome. That's, that's amazing. And it's, well, and it's so weird because the only reason I ever learned about Buzz Out Loud and the whole reason I know Tom is because his wife, Eileen, was the, uh, the producer for uh, Scam School. That's a weird, weird world that it works as yeah. part of our little secret social club. And by the way, you know, it's so funny because you, you hear successful people and you can't believe, like, for example, um, uh, Tom Kenny, the guy who plays SpongeBob and uh, Bobcat Goldthwait, uh, were, uh, got started in stand-up comedy together, right? And that's how they got their name, they were Bobcat and Tomcat. And, um, or at least that's what the, the uh, guy who owned the comedy club called him randomly. And they, uh, you, you think like, oh, it's so crazy that everyone knows each other, but it's like, all the reason that is is because those who were good at the game stayed in the game long enough and they all came up together, you know? And so it's like, that's what's happening now, you know? Like, like five years from now, it's, uh, uh, you know, I mean, already it's happening where people are like, wait, Brian Brushwood from Hacking the System and Andrew Main from uh, Don't Trust Andrew Brian Main are Brushwood friends? Friend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but if you like, like they, they both know each other but, and they do things together, that's so crazy. Oh, yeah, we do weird things together. That's... <laughs> Uh, I am uploading. Do, 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 do. And I am going to the right directory. Uh, there we go. Also shows you how much is going on that we just don't know about. <laughs> you know, what especially you when we're content creators, we're so much into our own content kind of thing that we're not aware of how <laughs> people make stuff. Yeah, right. Uh, bu -bu -bu, this was, oh, oh, while I'm thinking about it right now, uh, Neshcom, Bryce, um, uh, uh, there's that VO that I need to record. Can you type out what that is? And I will do that right now. Yeah, Bryce. Head downstairs. We'll see if he's, uh, I saw the rough cuts of, uh, what Bryce is working on. I'm very, very excited, uh, for, uh, April 1st, new product release coming, coming at you at, uh, Scam Stuff. <laughs> you guys will get a little little bit of a preview. You'll get an out of context uh, wild line. <laughs> no? Don't 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 let them uh don't let them hear the line. Okay, I'll I'll do it off the uh <laughs> I'll take us off uh off the stream. In fact, here, yeah, we'll go ahead and shut out, shut down the stream right now. Uh, thank you to everyone who hung out with us. You guys are awesome and will remain so for all eternity. Bye, guys. Roger Moore is being criticized for what they thought was a racist comment about Idris Elba playing oh. Bond. Uh, wait, so he just said, like, it doesn't fit? He doesn't? He doesn't well, 
number one, it says, when asked for his opinion on rumors that a black actor would portray Bond, the 87-year-old actor, all right, full stop, he's 87, all yeah. right? <laughs> um, he, said, I, he said that, uh, uh, he made some comment about Cuba Gooding years ago, I thought James may be played by Scott Welsh, my Englishman, but I think he should be English English, he continued. Nevertheless, interesting idea, but unrealistic. Um, and then everything. Set. Wow, that's uh, that is the most mild <laughs> inflammatory s- statement I've ever heard. Well, there is this. There is a weird like there was the guy that was the uh, oh, God. The, the, the one of these British detective shows, cozy that takes place in the middle of nowhere, and 